I thank you for the chance to continue on in your blessed book of Ezekiel. I thank you for the words that are so graphic and so strong. And Lord, I ask that you let us be exactly that, that we be strong in the power and the might of your scripture, that you would walk among us, that you would control everything that's said, <clears throat> that you would be pleased and glorified by our presence here and by the time spent in your precious word from our friend Ezekiel. We love you now in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in the 33rd chapter of Ezekiel. Let me tell you a little bit, just as a recap, and it's not going to be long because we've got quite a bit to do tonight. No surprise. This actually begins the fourth and last session or section of Ezekiel. And if you want, if you would allow me to recap that, the first section were chapters 1 through 3. You will recall that that was when God called Ezekiel. A hard time for young man Ezekiel. He had been trained to be a priest. His father was a priest. That's what he was going to do. He was only 25 years old. You cannot be a priest in Israel till you're 30. That's just the Levitical law. That's why Jesus started his ministry at 30. We recapped that and remembered that. So at 25, he was trained but not yet acting. And he was taken captive. He is in the second siege of Jerusalem by a world leader named Nebuchadnezzar. The first siege took Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and took them into the higher court, the kingly royal duties next to Nebuchadnezzar. The second bunch that was taken were the priests, and they were taken up into the northern part of Babylon, the Chibar Reservoir area. We like to call it where the not concentration camp, more like work camps, because Nebuchadnezzar was not stupid. He didn't kill his workers like Hitler was. He, uh, But they were workers. And so Ezekiel, being the priest that was trained to, found himself a little bit at a disadvantage until he turned 30, at which time God called him to be a prophet. So God used his training. And he's a very brilliant man. You're going to understand by his writing. He is, he is a contemporary of some famous folk. Jeremiah is in Jerusalem preaching, while Ezekiel is in the northern part of Babylon, and in the south, in the courtyard area is Daniel. We've got three big guns, three huge prophets that at the same time are all giving the same message. God brings out, I figured out that God will not forsake doing what he absolutely has to do to bring his people around. And if he has to at one time filter in the three biggest voices that really the Bible has in prophecy, three big ones, um, then he'll do it. He'll do whatever it takes to bring them around. Didn't work. Didn't work. Because unfortunately, human nature has its own wants. But in Ezekiel, we are in the last section. The first section then was God calling this young man Ezekiel, how he called him. And you will remember some of the classic things he saw, the visions that he saw were like no other in the Bible. And we spent quite a long time on that graphic section. I love it. It reminds you that heaven has is full of the most interesting creatures there are. When you get into the unseen realm, you can, eyes have not seen and ears have not heard what God has prepared. The second section then started at chapter 4. Four and went to 24 and it was called the condemnation of Jerusalem and it was God thumping and thumping and thumping Jerusalem and the contents of Jerusalem and the people of Jerusalem and everyone that thought they were so hot and so good and God thumped and thumped for 20 chapters. He detailed to the minutest dot and twiddle what was wrong with Jerusalem? And every sin was documented by this man, Ezekiel, so that there was nobody had any questions why God was going to do what he was going to do. And he told them for 20 chapters, you are going to fall. You're going to be taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. And there is no reprieve for you. And here's my end list after list after list of degradations and abominations and apostasies. It was just really kind of a nasty section. And then you do thumb back at yourself and think, is that how my heart looks to you, God? And then you say, maybe, and if it is, then forgive me. And God's quick to forgive. So those chapters 4 to 24 were, the sec were called the sex second section. Say that fast. Woo. The third section um, we are in now, or just finished last week, and that was God 
enumerating the enemies of Israel, and you can name them. Of course, there's Edom, and you and of, you remember Esau. That's Edom, and of course there were the two incestuous relationship with Lot's uh, daughter. Those those Moab and um, we know that from that illest, it, I call it illustrious. I mean, God still calls them cousins of the Israelites, but they're they're really kind of bad. So we have those, and then we had Tyre and Sidon up in the northern section. We spent quite a long time on Tyre. And the Sidonians, you remember, we have the renown of having Queen Jezebel come from that. And those were awful. And, he, so, and then we talked about the Philistines a little bit. So he really, the, the um, enemies of Israel, he was hard on. And that was that third section. We just finished that last week. We ended up with a four-chapter section on Egypt. And we saw God morph that like he does with most prophets from the Pharaoh into Satan himself. And the, the mastery of the writing of these prophets just never ceases to overwhelm me. And we saw that happen in that four-chapter section against Egypt. will tell you, and I hope you learn this from me, I tend to repeat because the fifth grade teacher and me learned one thing really well, repeat, 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 and that is this. If you see the word Egypt in the Bible, it's not good. It always means the world. It means pagan. And when God says they're just like Egypt, don't take that as gorgeous and decorated and pretty. It's awful. So just like early on when we studied, I said birds. Remember that? Heads up, birds are not a good thing in the Bible. It's always pointing to bad. Egypt is too. And we spent four chapters on that. So I think you remember Pharaoh morphing into the devil, into the Antichrist, and we went that route. We finished those sections now. We're in the next we're in the next section which is the last which is the fourth section and it's going to be the restoration of Israel. I was talking to one person I said and they said what are you teaching? I said I'm teaching Ezekiel. What chapter are you on? I said starting chapter 33 they go, "Oh, you're getting in the good part." And you'll find most pastors if they touch Ezekiel and that's so if. I mean that's like in the minute percentage of people that will do that. We'll start teaching at chapter 33. Here's where the good stuff gets. Here's where God has thumped and punished and administered judgment and talked about sin and he's told them what he's going to do and then he turns like God always does to the promise of a tomorrow for those who will receive. And he does that with Israel. Never, ever let anyone tell you that God is done with Israel, that they messed up, and that he has given up because that would make him a liar, and he is not. Always remember this. If that were the nature of God, that if you mess up, he's done with you, I'd be in hell, and so would you. Because Jesus wouldn't have come, and he did. Came that because we do mess up, and Israel's messed up, but there is a restoration coming for her. And from now till the end of chapter 48, we're going to get to glory in some of the restorations of Israel. And that's where we start tonight with the fourth section. And we're going to start with a theme you already know about, the one, and that is the watchman. We, we revisited that theme in chapter 3, long time ago. And you know this theme because it is kind of re repetitious through the Bible. If you are a watchman, I'm going to give you kind of a slow vernacular definition for a watchman. You are a person called by God to be on the wall, watching for danger to come, that when you see it, you warn those around you to be ready. That's what a watchman is. In our terms today, a pastor is supposed to be a watchman. He's supposed to be a literally on the wall, and I'm not saying standing out on the side of his church, but in his heart, he is to be <clears throat> eyes up, shields up, weapons ready, with loud horn ready to yell out when danger is coming to his church, and it is all around the American church, and there are so few watchmen. I strain my ears to hear. I turn on TV, pastors. I listen to radio, and I think, where are the watchmen? And God was saying, this is not new. God was saying this to Ezekiel. He's going to thump those pastors, and I know they're not called pastors. They're called rabbis. I know that. I'm going to say pastor. Those leaders of the Hebrew people are going to be held in high, in 
in high trouble because they were watchmen and they weren't calling out and telling. Who You know who the watchmen ended up being? Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And no one was listening. You're going to listen to... I hope to, when you hear these verses, and of course I will read each one, I hope you hear God's heart crying in this section. He tries. I, I am so in love with him, and I know you are too, that when I hear his heart cry, I'm just ashamed of myself. And that starts us then on the beginning of the last section of Ezekiel, chapter 33, verse 1. Let me tell you, this is about, um, about the time that the city of Jerusalem is going to fall. I'm going to tell you the exact verse that's going to happen, so we'll know that. But I'm in 33, verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. It is typical in commentaries you read about these next two chapters for a English-speaking, Western-minded, commentator person. I'm not even a common intellectual because some of them say they are, but they're not. I'm going to say the writer. It's typical for them to say this particular section of Ezekiel is the hardest books chapters to read in the Bible for a pastor because it's going to lay them out and maybe I can't agree with that maybe I should say I think it's two that should be required for every seminary student this is what you are required if you're a pastor a watchman's a pastor a simple words we read a little bit about him in Ezekiel 3. I want you to go there with me. Starting in verse 16 of Ezekiel 3. Now it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman. We know right off then this message is also for Ezekiel. For the house of Israel. So he is going to be the warner, the blower of the trumpet, the yeller, the herolder, the teller of what's coming for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. A watchman gives out warnings. How do I know that's what God said? It just said the words. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning or speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. When you read the rest of this section, and I'm not going to read it to you, but I've cited it, Ezekiel 3, 16 through 27, you can lay it on top of the very first part of Ezekiel 33 and 5. It is the same thing God says. When he says it once, wow, you better pay big attention. When he says it twice, stand on your head, do a little dance, whatever you have to, to get it down. But this is huge. So these same rules follow for every watchman. Let's, let's take it forward to a pastor. So basically he's saying, Pastor, if, you're, if you are not warning your people that they might die without the cross, without the blood of Jesus, without asking him into your heart, I require their blood upon you. That's what he's saying. You're not warning. Their, you're standing in front of your feel-good, multi-thousand dollar sanctuary in your Armani suit, and you're speaking... Not lies, you're speaking tickling ear idioms to them. You're telling little life stories, and you may be giving them a little thematic one verse quip that makes them go home and go, oh, I'm so good. And they're going to hell, and you're a watchman. I will require the blood of them on you. I think every pastor should be required to memorize that. Continuing on. When you blow the trumpet, they only had shofars then. 
A shofar had very few notes in its range of repertoire. In fact, it was so limited in playing that it didn't play <coughs> melodies like we think of as a trumpet. That trumpet is not a very good, um, I hate to say that. If you go to the Septuagint, they don't say trumpet, they say shofar. So I'm not saying it's not a good translation. For us, we think trumpet, but that's not what it was. Because our trumpet, if you play trumpet, you can play a song. You only play a few notes. And the trumpet and the shofar was used primarily for warning. When the trumpet shofar blew, it was a warning. It wasn't like when you stand up and the flag walks by and a military trumpet plays a really nice song. It's not like that. When they heard the shofar, they went, uh oh Heads up, warning, something's wrong. That's why when they say trumpet, you don't get the full jest. So he's saying this is a shofar. It was the sound of war when you heard the shofar. That's how you have to understand that. A Jew reading that would understand that. I'm going to take you to what the Apostle Paul says in Acts 20 about warnings. And I'm starting in 2025. And indeed now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no far, no more. This is Paul before he is beheaded. He knows he's going to die. He's actually ready and wants to. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Paul is referring back to Ezekiel 33, where God says, you are a watchman. If you don't warn the people, the blood's on you. And Paul is saying, I did it, God. I was a watchman, but I did it. I told him. And he's actually, the hint there in Acts 20 is, Paul knows what the watchman was supposed to do. He knows Ezekiel 33. That's a parallel. That's the Old and New Testament going just like this. Paul is saying, I did it, God. I didn't shirk my duty. I didn't cower and as, as a coward when people threatened to kill me. I'm in prison and I know I'm going to be beheaded. I know that. Bring it on. I did not not tell him the truth. See, that's Ezekiel 33. It's parallel. It's parallel. <clears throat> I'm continuing on in Ezekiel. I'm in verse 7. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman. For the house of Israel. God's repeating what he told him in the third chapter. And he's telling Ezekiel again. You are a watchman. If you want to do a real easy parallel with the word watchman. A synonym. You're a watcher. You're a spokesperson. You're a yeller out the warning person. That's what he's saying. You've got to warn your people. And by the way you were never made a watchman over a foreign group. You were always made a watchman over your own people. That's the rule God always gave. I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. Watchman means warner. You're a warner. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have to deliver your soul. Did you hear what Paul said right before he died? He said, God, I didn't shirk my duty. I did do the whole counsel of God. By the way, the whole counsel of God is Old and New Testament. The whole counsel of God. If you don't know Ezekiel 33, it would have made sense to you what Paul said. Paul was saying, I'm getting ready to die, and I understand the warning of being a watchman because I'm called to be a watchman, and I did it. I understand what you charged me to do. And I did not one time, once I found Jesus, I did not one time turn aside. He was beaten. This is not a <laughs> lesson on Paul, and we could go on a big side trip. He was beaten for dead, thrown outside the city. They thought he was dead. They threw him in a pile. He gets up, and he walks back in, and he starts preaching again. He was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And that's what a watchman is not ashamed to tell the hard truth. I think you're a watchman. You come sit every week at this lesson or you listen it on, to it t uh, on tape. And, and you, you go through an hour, sometimes an hour, 20 minutes, sometimes an hour of sitting. And it's not fun. You're not getting cheesecake or anything with it. And 
you're listening to the hard stuff and you're not moving and you're listening and I think you're a watchman and God knows that and he's pleased you're you're not shirking from the hard stuff and that's what Paul said that's what Ezekiel's saying right here I'm in verse 10 therefore you O son of man say to the house of Israel thus you say if our transgressions and our sins lie upon us and we pine away in them how can we then live Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? Therefore you, O son of man, say to the children of your people, the righteousness of the righteous man shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall because of it in the day that he turns from his wickedness, nor shall the righteous be able to live because of his righteousness in the day that he sins. When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, but he trusts in his own righteousness and commits iniquity, None of his righteous works shall be remembered, but because of the iniquity that he has committed, he shall die. Again, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. If he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has stolen, and walks in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his sins which he committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is lawful and right. He shall surely live. This is the doctrine of fairness. We're going to get into it in a minute, a little bit deeper. God says, I have no pleasure in sending evil people to hell. Hell was made for the evil angels and the devil. It wasn't made for people. We chose that. And it gives God no pleasure to do that. But because he's righteous, he will. Now, the interesting thing in this section is you're going to see through this chapter... You're going to see the word turn. It's going to be used eight times. If you don't know about numbers in the Bible, eight is the number of new beginnings. Isn't it interesting that turn would be a new beginning? He uses it eight times. Seven is the number of completion, because we know that from creation day. And on the eighth day, it was the new beginning. That's what's going to happen. After 7,000 years... The new beginning starts. And so, eight is the number of new beginnings. The no, I'm kind of into numbers. I love that. Turn, turn is used eight times in this chapter. It, we could use the synonym of repent. Turn, repent. Here's the classic repentance chapter in the uh, verse in the Bible. If you don't know it, commit it to memory. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall turn from their wicked ways and pray and seek my face and turn, there's that word, from their wicked ways and I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. Boy, that's an America verse that we need. Turn, turn, turn. Repent, repent, repent. And by the way, who is the righteous man in this chapter? Uh, he says, if, if you think you're so good that you don't need me, and you go on in your good works and you stand before me when you die. I say, get away from me. I never knew you. The Bible is explicit is that there is no one righteous. No, not one. I love Isaiah in this and it's very graphic, but I'm going to use it. Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all like an unclean thing and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. That means minstrel rags. You look to him, your righteousness looks like garbage we all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away isaiah nails that there's nobody righteous no not one there's not one person righteous romans let's go to paul remember paul is the one that was dying but in romans 3 he says this this should be a memory verse for you too maybe it is and i might just be reviewing what you already love but i'm in romans 3 10 there is none righteous no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They all have turned aside. They have all, they have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. If, people, if you ask someone, and I've done this, leading someone to Christ, and I said to them, if you stand before God tonight, he calls you in front of him, and he says, why should I let you in heaven? And you say, because I'm good. You take him to Romans 3.10, God said that you're not. There's not one of you that's good. 
But if you take it on Jesus, he doesn't look at you anymore. When he looks at me, he sees Jesus, who is the only good thing. And you see, this is already preempted here in Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel's already laying down. He's laying down the salvation message right here. You want to know where you see Jesus in Ezekiel? You see him right here when he said there's nobody righteous. If a righteous person thinks they're good, then you're not. If an unrighteous person repents and changes his life, he's good. That is salvation. You want to see where Jesus is in Ezekiel? He's in explaining the gospel. This is the gospel of Christ. There's no one righteous. No, not one. But if you turn... If you lay down your quote, quote, good pride righteousness and you put Jesus in front of you, then you have a way, the truth, and the life. And you see, I believe Ezekiel 33 is the gospel. I believe it's the gospel right here written 500 years before Jesus was even born. How is Jesus in the Old Testament? He's in every innuendo. He's in every nuance. He's in every phrase. And he is every word that is breathed in this because he is the word this is these are his words these aren't mine they're really not ezekiel's they're his that's really who's writing this i'm in verse 17 yet the children of your people say the way of the lord is not fair but it is their way which is not fair when the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall die because of it. But when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is lawful and right, he shall live because of it. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not fair? O house of Israel, I will judge every one of you according to his own ways. If you think there's corporate salvation, if you're going in on the hymns of your grandma or the coattails of your great-granddad who was a pastor, you haven't read Ezekiel. God's own words, not mine. I will judge every one of you according to his own ways. We each stand before God as an individual. I'm going to tell you, if you've, got, you've taken on the blood of Jesus and you have him as your total inside and out. You stand before God at the mercy seat of Christ. And what I'm so grateful for is that he's going to look at me and he's going to shake his head. But he's going to look to my right-hand side, which the shade of my right-hand side is my Savior. And he's going to, and Jesus is going to have his arm around me and say, she's mine. And God's going to say, it's okay then. I can look past all your mistakes. I can look past all your filthy rags. And I see my son. And that's why you stand there. And this is Ezekiel telling you this 500 years before this Messiah is even born. If you don't understand the righteousness, you cannot be righteous. God's telling Ezekiel, he said, speak these words, watchmen. Warn these Jews up in Jerusalem. This is his near future he's talking about. Warn those Jews up there. They can't be righteous enough. They've blown it. They're going into captivity. And then he's looking far into the future with these words. And he said, and tell my people that when Jesus comes, they have a way for righteousness through the Son, my Messiah. Because that's what prophets do. They go near and far. Let's go to Paul in Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. Or you could say not a result of your righteousness. So no one can boast. You haven't done a thing. You did not do a thing to deserve to be saved. Nothing. And that's what puts me on my face every morning when I really take a glimpse of me the day before. And I'm horrified. I'm horrified at my thoughts and my lack of praying and my lack of doing what God tells me to. And I'm horrified and I'm laying there horrified, and I realize Paul already knew that. God made a way through his son, Messiah. And that's who we, that's who we emulate. James 2, this would be Jesus' half-brother, who didn't believe him until he rose from the dead. Lived 30 years in his house and didn't believe him. James 2, 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? 
And let's go back where God said in Ezekiel 33, I will judge every one of you according to his own ways. Now, I'm not, don't hear me wrong in this. I'm going to make this crystal clear. You are not saved by your works. That's exactly what Ezekiel 33 said. But James takes it a step further. And he says, if you have no prophet, if you have no works, if you've done nothing, I don't think you're saved. Because the brother that died on the cross that is the Messiah now, James, saying that brother that I didn't get is really the Messiah. If he lives in you, you can't be quiet. You can't go your whole life shrouded in this cloak of mystery. Is she saved? Is she not saved? Because your works will scream out that you're crazy in love with this Jewish carpenter. And James says, basically, if you have no works, you're not saved. That spirit inside you cannot be quiet. And you see, I think we get that mixed up. And I'm not saying those works save you. I'm saying it is a result of being saved that you can't shut your mouth and live your life like you don't know him. I question people that die. This is just me. This is a Lindaism. You go to a funeral and they say, well, I looked for all kind of evidence to see if they were, and there was one verse that they had stuck on a postcard in 1922 that probably shows they were a Christian. No and no. Their life should have been screaming that Jesus was important. Even if you're not loud like me, and I know I'm loud and I talk fast, I'm I live loud. But everybody in your own way can live loud. You can leave little notes for people. You can send out postcards. You can send out um, little tweets. You can send out emails to people in encourage. There's a hundred things you can do without being loud like me, but loud in your own way. Because I think James and I think Ezekiel and I think Paul are saying, this, this gospel of Christ, you didn't earn. You didn't do one rotten thing to get it. Because your righteousness is just filthy rags. Your righteousness is from the Savior. And we see him in this chapter all over it. Now, the next chapter is real important. You should start, highlight, this is where Jerusalem falls. Remember that um, he's been telling him for five years it's going to fall. It falls. It, God's always true. And it came to pass in the twelfth year of our captivity in the tenth month on the fifth day of the month that one who had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said, The city has been captured. Well, duh! How many years has God been telling you? It happened. Now, I'm going to tell you about the dating. There are different mind thoughts on this. And that is that this is, he's qualifying the date that he heard the messenger. Maybe. Maybe. Others say, no, he's back figuring from when the messenger ran in. He figured how long it would take to get down the path in several months. And he's back figuring and tell you the exact date it fell. I don't know which it is. I'm going to tell you it's right, whichever it is. He's, and you can take the stand either way because there are great scholars that believe this is the exact date it fell. There's other scholars say this is the exact date the runner came and it was four months later. I don't know that. I'm going to tell you yes, yes. That's when it was. And you can decipher that because some things aren't worth picking about because you can't prove them. Uh, but we know it's true, so it fell. And, and that one who had escaped from Jerusalem, uh, there were not too many people that escaped. So this was a God thing. Most of them that tried to escape Nebuchadnezzar's skin and put on sticks outside the city. And he did that for hundreds of them. We know that according to history. Now the hand of the Lord had been upon me that evening before the man came who had escaped. And he had opened my mouth. So when he came to me in the morning, my mouth was opened and I was no longer mute. It implies this, that for a period, God had shut him up and not allowed him to give any words to the people. And I think God was saving him up for this grand announcement that, guess what, guys? Jerusalem has fallen. Jerusalem has fallen. And so God allows him to speak this out to the captives. The city has been captured. There are several dates. You can date that about January the 19th, 586 B.C. This is according to history. Other dates it at January the 8th, 585 B.C., depending on if you're counting when the runner came or when the runner announced that it actually fell. I don't know. 
I looked at several of my favorite history people, and they're all different. So I'm going to tell you it's around then, and it's all yes. The distance between Jerusalem and Babylon um, were about 900 miles. And so a typical average person on a caravan would take four months. If you were a runner and you raced at high neck speed and you didn't ever stop, who knows? I just don't know. That's the distance. And it was not, he did not come on a horse or we would have known that. So I'm guessing he came on foot. Second Kings 2511, we record this. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive the rest of the people who remained in the city. And this is Jerusalem. This is the captain that Nebuchadnezzar put in charge. And the defectors who had deserted to the king of Babylon, the rest of the multitude. Um, that's just recording that it actually did happen. You'll find the recording of Jerusalem falling in several places in the Bible. But like I said, if it says it once, it's important. If it's twice, it's big. If it's more than that, you know it's just heads up. Um... Uh, we heard about the hand of the Lord mentioned here. It's also, we see it several times. Ezekiel talks about the hand of the Lord in chapter 1, verse 3, and chapter 8, verse 1. We're going to see it later in 37. And so that hand of God is really important. I love the best example of the hand of God, I can believe, is when Daniel is talking and he's explaining that Bel Belshazzar, that stupid grandson of Nebuchadnezzar and has that big party and he and he uses the utensils from the temple as goblets and eating utensils and he's drunken and he's making a mockery of God and God's hand reaches down and he writes on the wall I love that but so it's ominous when you talk about the hand of God I just thought that was a good one to bring in because it's my favorite now I'll watch and read you something from from my favorite, John, and that's in Revelation 6. Let's go to the 15th verse. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of God. And, oh, sorry, from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand. And let's continue with Isaiah 2, verse 19. They shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth mightily. Continue on. I'm going to lay that on top of these next few verses. I'm in 23 of Ezekiel 33. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, they who inhabit those ruins in the lands of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one, and he inherited the land, but we are many. The land has been given to us as possession. Therefore, say to them, Thus says the Lord God, You eat meat with blood, you lift up your eyes toward your idols, and shed blood. Should you then possess the land? Note that question God's asking these people. You rely on your sword, you commit abominations, you defile one another's wife. Should you then possess the land? God's asking the same question twice. Say thus to them, thus says the Lord God, as I live. Surely those who are in the ruin shall fall by the sword. And the one who is in the open field I will give to the beast to be devoured. And those who are in the strongholds and caves shall die of the pestilence. Remember the verses I just read to you before? It's a parallel. For I will make the land most desolate. Her arrogant strength, that actually means pride. If you look that word up in Hebrew, it's pride. Her pride shall cease, and the mountains of Israel shall be so desolate that no one will pass through. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. This is one of the 70 times he says this. When I have made the land most desolate because of all their abominations which they have committed. What you see here, you're going to see a parallel. What I read to you earlier in Isaiah and Revelation were a picture of what's going to happen in the end times. Remember they tell you the kings will hide, the people will cry for the rocks to kill them. What you're getting a little glimpse here is when Jerusalem is captured that third time by Nebuchadnezzar because he's so brutal, he destroyed thousands. They were already starving because he'd set up a siege. They were already eating their children. They were shedding blood. They were, they were dying of pestilence and beasts were roaming around the cities. It was awful. It's a parallel to what it's going to look like in Jerusalem before Revelation 19. The end of the tribulation is going to look just like that. People are going to be crying for the rocks to fall on These nasty kings of the earth, which I think probably will be Nephilim kings, will be hiding in rocks. 
And then Jesus steps foot on that threshold of the sky in that big white war horse and the clouds apart and people fall on their knees. It says every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, and it's too late. This is that same picture. It's almost like you get a mini glimpse of what it's going to look like. It looks like this now. This is the near future. Jerusalem has actually fallen. It's the third siege of Nebuchadnezzar, and he's done. He At this siege, he is absolutely going to burn the city to the ground. The temple's going to be burnt to the ground. Oh, no, you say, God's temple? It's not been God's temple for a long time because they made it. The abominations inside that temple, God had, the Shekinah glory had left chapters before, had left. This is, this is God's, God's left Jerusalem, and it's going to be burnt to the ground. And it's parallels. 2,000 plus years later to the tribulation. We don't know when. Same thing's going to happen. And so that's what you know. Um, it's a graphic picture. It, there are not too many survivors in that. They're either taken captive or murdered. And this one survivor that escapes, you know, has to be from God. And like what he says to the people, they're saying, Oh, we've been here and, and, and we've been, you know, in Jerusalem doing your will, blah, blah, blah. And he said, should I? The question he asks is, should you possess the land? And he starts listing their sins again. Now, remember, we went through a litany of 20 chapters of him listing the sins that were going on. And, and so they try to argue with God. They're trying to argue with Ezekiel, saying, God's not going to destroy us. And God says, ask him this twice. After all this, should you possess my land? Twice he has it. Of course, the answer is no. And he seeks to continue on and finish that. Let me review the Abrahamic covenant with you, just so you know. And I'm in Genesis 12. You should know this. This is probably stored in one of your places of remembrances. Because I give it to you uh, every few weeks. Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And do you know, see where it says all the families of the earth? I wrote my name there. I did, because God said that, that Abrahamic covenant stands today. God hasn't nixed the Bible. God's not said there is no Bible anymore. That covenant was made, and he said, In you all the families will be blessed. I wrote my name. My family will be blessed because I stand with Israel. Anyone that wants to, and I'm going to be political here, so you can just nix this off of listening if you don't like it. Just take me off your list. I don't care. President Trump has done one thing right. If he's done nothing else, he's done one thing right. And I have one word for you people that are against him. It's Israel. You want to go back and read that Abrahamic covenant? His family's going to be blessed. That's not my words. That's God's words. And because I stand with Israel, I'm going to claim that blessing. God didn't, God didn't negate any of his blessings in the Old Testament. He didn't change his word. Jesus said, I came to fulfill every law. And that's every covenant too. You should know that covenant. That should be, if you don't have it memorized, you should know exactly where to go because that's your promise. That's why, why do you stand with Israel? We need to get grounded in why we do things because it's scriptural. And because God said, if you stand with my people and Abraham will be, I'll bless all the families of the earth. Write your name in there. That's you. Write your family's name in there. Because you're going to stand with Israel and you are by golly going to be blessed. Because that's God's word, not mine. I'm going to take you to Deuteronomy 28.63. This is another one of those jewels. And it shall be that just as the Lord rejoiced over you to do so, to you good and multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing, and you shall be plucked from the off the land which you go to possess. This is why they are being taken off the land, because they did not stand with God. That land's conditional. You get the land as long as you follow me. You know why? Why he took the twelve, the ten tribes, and he scattered? Conditional. They broke their they broke their promise to God. Now. He's going to bring them back because he will stay with his promise. Even though they broke it, this is how good God is. We have a new covenant that's mine and yours. And anyone who has the blood of Jesus 
as their own. And I'm going to read it to you from our Dr. Luke 22, verse 20. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup, is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. You know what your new covenant is? The promise that the shed blood of Jesus would bring you into the fold. That's your covenant. What's your new covenant? The blood of Jesus shed for you is yours. Isaiah 29, 13, Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. Isaiah saw the same thing. These people were giving God lip service in Jerusalem, and God was tired of it. He destroyed them. He didn't care about your lip service. You know what? You could be silent before him and be so crazy in love with him that you're worshiping inside your own heart, and he gets it. He's not interested in your words unless it's glorifying him. Just isn't. Matthew 15, verse 8, Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. I want you to know those are exactly the same verse spoken 500 years apart. Matthew quoted Isaiah. And this is the exact same section we're talking about Ezekiel. It is a perfect paraphrase for Ezekiel 33. I'm not interested in your righteous lips. I'm interested in your righteous heart. Old and New Testament cannot be separated because they are just like this. They're back and forth and they're interwoven so that when you look at it all, it all weaves into God's Word. Continuing on in our study for tonight, 33 verse 30. As for you, son of man, the children of your people are talking about you beside the walls and in the doors of the house, and they speak to one another. Everyone's saying to his brother, please come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. So they come to you as a people do. They sit before you as my people, and they hear your words. But, and this is the saddest section in this part of the Bible. I think it is truly sad. They do not do them. And in other words, they're giving you lip service, Ezekiel. They're bound, they're coming out. You're the watchman on the wall, and you're speaking it like I've told you you're being obedient, and they act like they're listening, and they're gathering. Now, remember, there's no TV, there's no video, so he's in the, probably the town square. He's on probably a higher platform where they can hear him, and he's probably got a booming voice. God probably equipped him with that, I'm just guessing. And he's speaking what God said, and they're sitting there enthralled with every word he says. And they do not do it. Not my words. Sad, sad, sad. For with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue what? Their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice that can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. He said that twice now. Remember the, the rule of twice? And when this comes to pass, surely it will come. Then they will know that a prophet has been among them. Here's another question people might ask you. How do you know Ezekiel's a prophet? Somebody labeled that when they put the cannon together. I don't have to guess. God says he's a prophet right there. He said, a prophet has been among them. I love this chapter. I think if I were a pastor, I would resign my, my commission and go lay before God for years in, in solitude because... Think what he's saying here. And of course, we have to take this to heart. I'm not a pastor, and you're probably not either if you're listening to this, because most pastors don't listen to Ezekiel. But we are commissioned to be ministers. And this is really a thumb pointing back itself chapter for me. Man, I, I know, and I know myself, and I'm just going to be honest, and you know me too, because it's not going to be a surprise. I'm loud. I know that, and I'm in your face, and I'm out there. That's just how God made me. That, that isn't anything special. That's just who I am. But I have to be careful about this because none of that means anything to him 
unless he's first and unless he is highlighted in every one of those loud sayings I say. And if you're soft and if you're quiet, none of that's anything to God unless in those quiet moments you're emulating him. And I think this is a real thing. Both thumbs pointing back at yourself chapter, saying, God, how do I how do I take this chapter? And I take it hard. It's a hard chapter. But boy, is it sobering. Let's continue on. Now we're going to get a real picture of Jesus. If you didn't see him in that chapter, I'd get a really poor job explaining the gospel to you that he laid down. But this one should be crystal clear. We're going to see the picture of the shepherd. If you thought when Jesus was quoted in John 10... I am the good shepherd that he made that up. Oh, no. He's quoting Ezekiel 34. Love it. Uh, we're going to see the Messiah come into being. We're going to see a glimpse of the uh, millennial kingdom. And actually, this prophecy is, a, is going to, it against the pastors, and like I said, one commentary, in fact, two or three commentaries, I said this is the strongest indictment of pastors in the Bible. If they would read it and take it to heart, they would change. Now that's the if. Big, the big humongous if on the block is would they read this one. But no doubt, most people read the strongest indictment against pastors. He's going to use the word my flock 12 times. 12 is a perfect number for him. He had 12 disciples. There were 12 tribes of Israel. I'm kind of into numbers. I think God does nothing by mistake. We don't have to guess at anything. He's explained it to us. It is a perfect, complete number. And he says it 12 times. His flock is going to be complete when he's done with this. He's going to call them my sheep three times. We're going to get that sheep reference. We do know three is the Trinity number. It's the number of God. He calls them my sheep. And one time he's going to end up with their... Not, they're going to go from being this people that has been scattered and abominations and taken captives. And he's going to end this chapter and they're going to be back to his my people. You're going to watch the transition. The writing on this is exquisite. Because it goes from this scattering and he's going to bring it full around to my flock, my sheep. And then they're going to be my people. And the mastery of this writing reminds me of Isaiah. Of course, it's God's writing, so I guess he's going to sound like that, right? I'm in verse 1 of chapter 34. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. When you see shepherd, it's the leader, it's the pastor, it's the head of the flock. Jesus is the great shepherd, but we have other shepherds under us, and they're always pastors, or they're always the religious leaders. And so he's, this word is coming against them. Prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves, should not the shepherds feed the flocks. 2 Samuel 5, 2. Also in the time past when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, by the way, speaking to King David, You shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. Pay attention to who David is. He's going to come full circle at the end of this chapter. Number 17, 27, 17. Who may go out before them and go in before them? Who may lead them out and bring them in that the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep who have no shepherd? Always the shepherd. It's another. These are another one of those words when you get the vocabulary for the Bible down when it Hones in on a shepherd, he's holding in on a religious leader. Pastor, rabbi, religious leader. Jesus is the great shepherd, of course we know that. No one can be as good as him. But this is what that means. Jeremiah 17, 16. As for me, I have not hurried away from being a shepherd who follows you. Jeremiah is calling himself a shepherd. He was left in Israel with those evil priests to try to shepherd those people back. We will study that next time we study another book. Nor have I desired the woeful day. You know what came out of my lips. It was right there before you. And Jeremiah is saying, I was the shepherd and they would not follow. 1 Peter 5.2 Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eager. 
and he is talking about spiritual shepherds and he does it in first peter 2 25 as well for you were like sheep gone astray but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls here was a term that made my heart smile this week maybe you know this and i've read it but when i thought of jesus is the shepherd and the overseer of my soul put those two words together He's the shepherd and he's the watchman. Because I told you what a watchman was. Here is Peter using these two chapters of Ezekiel. And he's saying Jesus is the watchman and the shepherd of your soul. The two things we're just studying and that's Jesus for you. I don't know, maybe that doesn't impress you. But I kind of wept when I put those two things together. Oh, thank you, Lord. That was big for me. Now, you know John 10. I can, you could quote it probably without looking, but I'm going to say it to you. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. Jesus quotes that verse, and he's quoting from Ezekiel 34. He's quoting. He's saying to you Jews, you know what Ezekiel told you Jews? Your shepherds were bad. Remember he warned them before Jerusalem fell? Because they know this. The Jews are studiers. They knew this. And he was preaching among them. And he said, you remember that story? I am the good shepherd. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees are horrified at him. They're, they're fighting with him. If you know this book of John, John 8, they basically call him a bastard. And you need to read John 8, and then you need to watch when he turns on his... And you are your father, the, your, the viper. You're, the, you're your father, the devil, who's like a viper. And he calls them vipers because they called him a bastard. And he comes back. Boy, Jesus gives too. He doesn't lay down at all. And he's basically... Let, then you lay this verse down here. He says, I am the good shepherd. Knowing that those Pharisees and Sadducees watching him would take him back to Ezekiel 34, which you now know what God's talking about. God says these evil shepherds are leading the flock astray. And Jesus is saying to them, you're evil shepherds. When you put all these verses together and lay this back on Ezekiel 34, and John used, and, and, and Jesus uses this phrase, I am the good shepherd. They are so angry at him. You start reading John, they begin plotting to crucify him. From chapter 8, when, he, when they call him a bastard, and he comes back, I am the good shepherd, in chapter 10. The book of John is a perfect parallel of John said of John writing how Jesus sets himself up with those Pharisees and Sadducees to be crucified. Never think for a moment that Jesus got accidentally crucified. For this reason I came, he said to Peter. And he begins setting him up in John. And he begins saying these verses. But if you don't know this part of Ezekiel, you don't understand that John 10.10 10 was him saying, I am that good shepherd. And he's pointing them back to Ezekiel. Do you see how Jesus is all over this Old Testament book? And so what it, it begins the process for the Pharisees and Sadducees to begin convoluting their arguments against him to take him to the cross. Exactly what he planned for them to do. This is not a mistake. This is a well orchestrated plot. I love this. First Kings twenty two seventeen, then he said. I saw all Israel scattered on the mountain as sheep that have no shepherd. God's talking about when Saul was king. People were running to and fro, and they and he and Saul got all off. Remember, he went down and consorted with a witch. I mean, he's just an awful king. And the Lord said, "These have no master. Let them return to his house in peace." I'm trying to give you little examples where the sheep are Israel. The shepherd was Jesus. And this, my flock, used 12 times in this section. God's trying to say to Israel, yeah, you're going to be scattered. You are. Jerusalem's fallen. You're scattered. But I'm sending a shepherd. I'm sending the good shepherd that in the end is going to gather you back. And see, this is all preemptive 
pointing to Jesus. I'm in verse 3. You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. But with force and cruelty, you have ruled them. He's nailing the shepherds of Israel right before they fall. And he's going to nail them over and over because God's, God's taken down Jerusalem. I'm in verse 5. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. I want you to know that beast of the field is a direct reference to demons and demonic activities. You laid them open to demons with all of your pagan worship. You laid the worship of demons at their feet. You awful shepherds of Israel is what he's saying. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every hill. Yes, my flock, and there's that one of those 12 times, was scattered over the whole face of the earth and no one was seeking or searching for them. I'm going to give you a little glimpse here of what Matt. I'm going to take you to Matthew a minute in verse 16, verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. This church that Matthew's writing about, that Jesus began telling him about, the Apostle Paul said the Old Testament did not know about you. We are looking in Ezekiel, and God's talking about his people, my flock, my shepherd, my flock, but Paul and Matthew and Peter are starting to get against when Jesus comes. There's more to this. The Gentiles are going to get let in. And that's a massive secret that right now Ezekiel doesn't know. Just a point. I, I like to do that because we need to know who you are. I'm in verse 7. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord as I live, says the Lord God. Surely because my flock became a prey. And my flock became food for every beast of the field. I think that's demonic there too. Because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherd search for my flock. But the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds. And I will require my flock at their hand. Remember the earlier warning? If, you, if you're not telling the truth, if you're not telling them the heart, so I'm going to require their blood on your hand. He's telling these shepherds, you're doomed. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths, that they may no longer be food for them. And this is a subtle hint at the millennial kingdom that's to come which will bring my flock back to me. And I'm using those words as God speaking them. Not to myself, but to Jesus. And he's saying, my flock will come back to me. And that's a hint at the, at the remnant that will be saved in the millennial kingdom. At the end of the tribulation, when Jesus comes to rescue him, that's the hint. Is Jesus all over this chapter? You betcha. And it's not very hard to see him. I'm in verse 11. For thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I myself, that's a double whammy, I myself, too. Every time we use two things in the Bible, it's a biggie. He's making it so emphatic that these quote, quote, evil shepherds, these quote, quote, leaders of the Israelites, these evil pastors, these evil religious leaders, he's saying, you want to know who's doing this? It's me, me, myself. I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out as a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep. So I seek out my sheep. Notice he's gone from my flock. Now you're my sheep. That's more individual. We've gone from the group flock and we're going to take it in individual. These are my, the sheep of my pasture. You know that verse. And deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. And when you do a research on that cloudy and dark day, I'm going to take you way far. Follow with me because I'm a wordy. Those words are used when you were talking about the tribulation. Joel called it the day of the Lord. This is the same 
flavor. He's saying on that cloudy, dark day, clouds represent a kind of judgment. When we're raptured, Jesus comes with a cloud because the judgment begins on the earth. When he comes back in Revelation 19 in his second coming to rescue the remnant, he comes with a cloud because there's judgment on the earth. And this cloudy and dark day is the judgment on the earth. So we've done what all prophets do. We've stepped out of Jerusalem following, following in his near future, right now falling. And we're going to step way into the tribulation on this cloudy and dark day when I'm going to rescue my flock again. Because it's the same story. Jesus is the rescuer in chief. And he's going to have to rescue his flock from the Antichrist in the end times. And that cloudy and dark day is that Joel phrase, that always ominous phrase that points you to the tribulation on that cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries. This is saving the remnant at Petra and will bring them into their own land. When's he going to do that? He's not going to bring them back into their own land until they march with him into the millennial kingdom after the tribulation. There's going to be a sheep and goat judgment and he's the nations that were for the Israelites are going to be allowed in and the 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 Christian Jews, that third remnant that rushed to Petra to be saved, he rescues and he saves them. He kills off all the bad guys and he marches with them. We follow on our white horses with him and march into the millennium. And that remnant is rescued from that cloudy and dark day into that new promise where he gathers them together from all the nations. All 12 tribes are restored. There is a remnant from every tribe that reappears in the millennial kingdom. And that's what he's promising here. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel. Yes, he will because he sets up his new kingdom. He sets up the new Jerusalem on the Mount Zion. It comes down from heaven and it sits on its perfect place right over the mount. And that's where Jesus Christ rules for a thousand years. In the valleys and in the inhabited places of the country, I will feed them in good pasture, and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in good fold and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. This sounds like Isaiah. Isaiah is your perfect example of the millennial kingdom where the, the, the lion lays down with the lamb and the child plays with the snake it's the millennial kingdom the same language that both authors both Isaiah and both Ezekiel are saying the same thing I will feed my flock and I will make them lie down do you remember the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he maketh me to lie down in green pastures Psalm 30 Psalm 23 is an echo of Ezekiel 34 they're just like this He's talking about the flock. He's talking about lying down in green pasture. The same story. And they're talking about the millennial kingdom where Jesus rules the whole earth as king and glory. I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away. Bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. Luke 15, 4. What man of you having a hundred sheep if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. This picture is based on just what Ezekiel said in 34th chapter. Luke is talking about Ezekiel 34. This pasture flock picture, those New Testament writers were echoing what Jesus said because Jesus wrote Ezekiel 34. These are his words. The sheep flock story, this picture of that, Jesus wrote that in Ezekiel 34. Why would he not quote it in Luke? Why would he not quote it in John and Matthew? He wrote it. These are his words. And you can't separate the old from the new. They are the same. Jesus said, I am the same. I change not. Psalm 97, verse 1. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad. Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Because before he sets up his throne, the clouds and the darkness come through the tribulation. He comes on the cloud and he pierces the darkness. 
you know that story. That's exactly what they're talking about. I'm continuing on in verse 17. And as for you, O my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I shall judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. Is it too little for you to have eaten up the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pasture, and to have drunk of the clear waters that you must foul the residue with your feet? And as for my flock, they eat what you have trampled with your feet, and they drink what you have fouled with your feet. He's given an example here of the shepherds, or quote, quote, the rabbis, quote, quote, that were left in Jerusalem were false. And they were eating up what food is left. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar laid siege against Jerusalem for several years till there was no food. The people were so hungry they were eating their children. And yet, it seemed how religious leaders always had enough to eat. Gee, how funny is that? And God notices. This is what he's talking about. You didn't take care of my flock. You took care of yourself. There's going to be a sheep and goat judgment. If you want to, I don't have tonight, time tonight because that would take me at least an hour to go on. We did study it and we did Revelation, but it Matthew 25 explains it. And it's kind of a reference there. God's going to judge between the sheep and the goats right before we go into the millennial period with him. And that's a little bit of a veiled reference to that. Basically, I'm going to judge between all of you. The sheep and the sheep and the goats and the goats. And you'll walk by me and I'll know your heart and that's how it's going to be. Period. I don't care if you call yourself a shepherd. You've been eating up all the goods and my people are going hungry. I'm going to judge you. And that's, he's just being really hard on the religious leaders. I think this chapter would be well read among America's religious leaders. And I'm just saying it would be a really good task. And I'm in verse 20. Therefore, Thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I myself, there's that double emphasis again, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep. Always fat is not good, and I'm not pointing at anyone, I'm pointing back at self. Fat means an overabundance or you've not helped somebody. The fat and the lean sheep. Because you have pushed with side and shoulder, butted all the weak ones with your horns and scattered them abroad, therefore I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, my servant David. If you do not know that in the millennial kingdom, King David's going to serve in the temple. Now, I want you to know about this because there is different feelings about this. I'm pretty secure what I believe, so I'm going to teach you that, but I'm going to tell you the other side of this. I believe King David actually is one of us when we walk into the millennium. He serves with the Lord in, his, in the new temple in, in the new Jerusalem in, in the millennial. I believe that. Other people believe that's just a veiled reference to Jesus serving by himself, that he is of the lineage of David, which I do know he's in the lineage of David. But I believe there are many times that I don't have time to go back in Isaiah and some other chapters that prove to you that King David himself will rule and reign with Jesus. And this is what I'm saying here. You don't have to believe that. If you think it's only Jesus as he said the lineage of David, then I say, good for you. And we just go on. Because there's some of these things we cannot prove till we walk in there. Either one's good, and it's all, every word is true. And my trouble is I'm stuck with this human brain that doesn't understand everything, even when I research. So I say, God, thank you, and we go on. So I believe this is literally King David serving with Jesus, and you may think it's just Jesus. That's totally good. But this is what it says. And remember, I'm a literalist. So when it says King David, I happen to think if he said, and Jesus will be doing it, I believe he'd say Jesus. But that's just me. I'm going to go back and start at 23 again. I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. My servant David, he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. See, I think they both served. I think we see Jesus higher, and I think David serves in the temple. That's just what I think. I think that's what it says. Now, um... It, I'm going to give you a couple of references for that. I'm not going to read them to you tonight. If you want to read about King David, it's Isaiah 55, 3 and 4, Jeremiah 38 and 9. And then we're going to see this same reference in Ezekiel 37, uh, verse 25. He's going to bring it up again. 
And we'll read that when we study on, because I know we're, we're going to run out of time here. And I'm in verse 25. I will make a covenant of peace with them and cause wild beasts to cease from the land, and they will dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. This is just like the Malala kingdom. There is no wild beast. Everybody lays down and rests together, exactly like Isaiah promised. I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing, and I will cause showers to come down in their season. There will be showers of blessing. Have you ever wondered where that song was? There shall be showers of blessing. Da, 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 da. I don't know. But that's where they get it from. This is for the book of Ezekiel. Then the trees of the fields shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase. They shall be safe in their land. They shall know that I am the Lord. This is millennial kingdom stuff. When I have broken the bands of their yoke and delivered them from the hand of those who enslaved them. He's talking about his people now. They're back in the land, and he's their God. And they shall no longer be a prey for the nations, nor shall beasts of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and no one shall make them afraid. Do you not wish the Palestinians would read this chapter and quit shooting things over at Israel? I will raise up for them a garden of renown, and they shall no longer be consumed with hunger in the land. This is a direct reference to that siege time when they were literally starving to death. He said, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure you're never hungry again. I'm going to take care of you. Because when you come to me and I rescue you in the tribulation, I rescue that third, you're mine forever. And finally we get to live like we're supposed to. This is the promise. Nor bear the shame of the Gentiles anymore. Thus they shall know that I, the Lord their God, am with them. And they, the house of Israel, are, get this, underline, underline, exclamation, are my people says the lord we have gone the full gamut and anyone who is a person that is a replacement theologian i beg you to read this chapter god is not done with israel yes he's mad of course and he takes them out of jerusalem but he takes them to the promise of the millennium and he calls them his people does that sound to you like he is done with them no and that's another no don't fall into that trap. Don't believe that lie because that is a sinkhole. You won't get out of that. Get the, get the blessing that I told you about that I claim for my family and understand these are his people. Now, am I a Jew? No. Am I his people? I'm grafted into the bloodline because of Jesus. And I'm the bride of Christ. And I'm a priest and a king with him. But I am not a Jew except by adoption. These are his people people and he's gone the full gamut from punishing him kicking him out of jerusalem scattering and he's brought him down through the tribulation the doomy dark the gloomy dark days and he's rescued him in petra and he's walking him into the millennium where he and david are on the throne and they are his people do you see how ezekiel's brought you through the whole gamut of history like prophets do and he's pointing him to the new covenant, promising there's going to be rain. And that rain is always a promise of blessing in the Bible. You should know that. In fact, when he talks about uh, latter rain, and rain, I can't even talk tonight, sorry. I talk too fast and too loud. The former rains always break the drought in Israel because that comes in October, November. It seems kind of funny, but that's when their best growing season is. So when he promises that, he's promising, I'll break your drought. I will water you with blessings. And that's what the millennial kingdom is going to be like. It's going to be one huge blessing for Israel. A promise kept. Promise kept. Verse 31. You are my flock. The flock of my pasture. You are men and I am your God. Says the Lord God. I guess that just sums it up. You're men and I'm God. And I get to make the rules. And the rules I make are, I may punish you, and I will if you are unjust, but I will bring you home. And I will set you in a kingdom with my son as Messiah and King David ruling over that temple where you'll never go hungry again. You'll never be destroyed by beasts. You will never be onslaughted by the Gentile nations. And you will be in a glorious state that I always intended you to be in. Because I'm God. I get to make the rules. When he says, you're men and I'm God, he's saying, 
I get to make these rules. And I believe every word of it. I want to read you a couple promises, and then we're going to take it home tonight. 1 Peter 2.25, For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. That's my verse for this week. It, when I get down and not loud and have to be quiet and things hit in on me and the world comes in hard, all I have to do is look to the overseer of my soul who is the watchman and the keeper of the flock, and he was my shepherd. Father, we thank you for the words that are precious of uh, Mr. Ezekiel, who not only echoed in Isaiah and Matthew and Paul and Peter, Jesus himself quoted these sweet, precious words. And we thank you, Lord, that we can tie them together and we can see your grand plan that through the centuries your word has not changed. It has not morphed. It is not entangled. It has simply been there staring at all who would read it and know it. We thank you for the promise, Lord, of the millennium that's coming. And Lord, we ask that you would let us be loud and be good watchmen over those that you have given us to watch over, and that we not shy away from speaking your truth. We love you and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.